Uh oh, Seamus. Uh oh, indeed. So my wife got exposed to COVID. Now she's fully vaccinated. Vaccine, then booster, and then she got it anyway. Um two months ago. But, you know, she works outside of the home and she was exposed to somebody who turned out, you know, later to have COVID. And she's like, but I'm probably not going to get sick, you know, because I've had it and I've been vaccinated twice. Right. But then, uh, then she got real sick. But it, it might not have been COVID. It didn't act like COVID. Like, COVID's sort of famous for attacking the lungs, and this was just sort of fever, aches, and pains, and sniffling. Hmm. Are there even diseases in the world other than COVID now? Right? Right? COVID hogging all the headlines, sweeping the awards at the, at the disease awards <laughs> two years in a row. <laughs> Western World Disease Awards. And the people's choice for this year. Give a hand for. Uh, and then today she she was recovering. You know, she re you, she reached that point, you know, where you start sweating and your body's like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's always like 2 a.m. and you wake up and your bed sheets are soaked and you're like, I don't want to change my bed sheets, but I can't go back to sleep because my bed is all cold. Right. She reached that today. And we've been like. I've been like cowering in my office and not going near her because if it's COVID, again, COVID would be super dangerous for me because I'm asthmatic. Mm. Mm. Asthmatic and anemic. So it would really put me on my ass. And then, uh, and then as she's recovering about an hour ago, I was like, oh, I feel awful. Oh, no. I just, like, I don't even have any symptoms yet. You know that beginning where you feel yourself getting sick and you're just like, mm -hmm. something's wrong. But, like, no major symptoms yet. You just feel really run down all of a sudden. That's where I'm at. This could blow over and I'll be fine in the morning. Or this could be, oh, I've got the flu this week and, and that's going to suck. Or I could fi I'm finally going to have my showdown with COVID. We don't know. As of this recording, we don't know which way it's going to go. Oh, man. I, I kind of feel bad having a, a, a podcast now. <laughs> Do you have any, any last words you want to share with your audience, Seamus? Uh, Kai Ling sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Worth it. I, I almost told you, I don't want to do the show. Like, I'm just going to go lay down. But I'm like, but there's nothing wrong. And if it turns out I'm just feeling run down tonight, maybe I didn't get enough sleep last night and I'm fine, then I'm going to feel really stupid. So let's just, let's oh, just man, cowboy yeah. up and do it. It's like, uh, it's, it's like when your kid, it has like the stomach flu and throws up and then you feel nauseous, even though you don't have it. And you're just like, I'm, I'm fine, but I don't feel good because someone else is sick. Right. So I went back to risk of rain two this weekend. Hmm. I haven't played since the game entered like beta or, you know, early access like a year and a half ago or something. And I played it and I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I love Risk of Rain, yeah, it's especially the second game. You know, like I've said in the past, it's a game that lets you break it. Yeah. You can pick up, you pick up items as you play. And, you know, this item will make you shoot 10% faster, and this one will make you do this much more damage. But, you know, you can pick up that same item multiple times if you happen to find them. And if you get a bunch of them and can shoot at some unreasonable rate, yeah, there's no hard limit of like, okay, but only the first three count, and after that, you know, the game ignores them, because otherwise that would be game-breaking. Risk of Rain does not care. They're like, go ahead, break the game. See if we care. Yeah, yeah, and, and and the UI is just kind of like, all right, fine, fill up your screen with icons of of you know shoulder right. cannons or whatever. Um, I haven't played since those early access days, and apparently they introduced achievements. So I fired up the game yesterday, and I got twenty achievements. Just launch the <laughs> game, and then it just sits there and achievement, achievement, achievement for all the stuff I'd already done. 
and um, I'm exploring the new content, and I just really like it. It is so good. I haven't Friendly... played it for a while either. It, what do they add? Well, the game has an ending now. Last time I played, you just looped forever. Mm -hmm. Now there's a proper end boss. Pretty cool boss. I really like the boss. Really cool look. This is this psycho with a big old hammer that pounds you like a nail. <laughs> and uh, one-shotted me the first time I fought him. He, you know, I was dodging all over the place, and I nearly had him. And at the end, I was like, oh, cool, I'm finally going to beat this game. And then he ran up to me, and I was not taking it seriously anymore because I'd, I'd aced the first 90% of the fight. Oh. And he finally caught me with this hammer right on the head and just, boom, game over. <laughs> <laughs> Crashed to <Oops>. <laughs> desktop. <laughs> right. Knocked me out of my chair in the real world. So Risk of Rain 2 continues to be awesome. I love it. Um, What have you been playing? Well, I've been playing some more uh, Deep Rock Galactic and uh, this and that. But just a oh, couple been days ago... I've been watching for you on Deep Rock Live, the friends list open, and I want, you know, wait to see you appear in the game. But uh, it hasn't lined up for us in the past few days. Yeah. Well, I've also, I mean, like, this isn't gaming related, but uh, my wife just had a baby uh, this past Sunday. Congratulations! So I haven't been playing as much video games as, as maybe I could have been. Yeah, definitely... Uh gonna see if see you in game less for the next few weeks i imagine yeah there are some priorities but i have managed to squeak in a few hours of, of gaming and it turns out that dyson sphere project has released an update which is uh, it's pretty nice i am enjoying it probably wise to play a single player game that you can pause when you have new baby yeah or, or you know where there's no penalty for like not doing anything and just walking away <laughs> right I, the main thing that they changed were the um, the end game kind of hassles. Like when you're building a Dyson Sphere, I spoke earlier about like there's no tools to automate like building all the little connections and like filling in all the panels and things. And so, and that's still true, but now you can copy when you've made a Dyson Sphere layout, you can just copy it and paste it onto any other layer in the Dyson Sphere, any other sphere. Uh, so that makes it so much easier to just double the capacity of your Dyson Sphere or whatever. Uh, so that's very, very nice. I still need to get back into that game. Everybody everybody tells me to give it another chance, and I think they're right. It sounds like something... Every time I hear it described, it sounds like something I'd like. And then I fired it up, and I was like, I don't know, it's not grabbing me. But then you talk about it, and I'm like, this sounds like fun. <laughs> well, it's gotten Twice. more fun. Uh Another thing that is kind of a hassle by the end of the game is you, you build these outposts to collect resources and then ship them back to your main base. Um, but you have to build all the little miners and they have to go around little mineral spots and you have to kind of place them all manually. You can't just like slapdash them on there and then you have to build all the conveyor belts back to your resource things. You have to hook up the resource things with the right kind of resources and have them ship them back to the stellar, the interstellar outpost and that thing has to ship this stuff. It's just kind of a, a pain. Um, so they recently added a advanced miner and it'll cover one of them will cover an entire resource spot unless it's a very large resource spot. Uh, so you just need to place one of them and they have the built in uh, resource drone port. So they'll ship directly to your interstellar depot. And uh, so you just like go around placing power poles and, and slapping these guys down and you're done. And it's like, oh, it's so much nicer. It's, it's so convenient. Nice. And I've added a few other things, but uh, th those are the main things in, in my book. It's like very, very nice convenience feature. So I was playing it a bit. I'd, I'm probably done with it again. I've still got like my one terawatt Dyson Sphere that's at like 5% capacity. So there's not really much stuff I need to do. A terawatt of power. How much is that? Like, does the well, United States I mean, the game's North kind of cartoony. A terawatt? Yeah, like the, I'm just trying games, to put it. Yeah, I, I'm not saying, oh, that's unrealistic. I'm just trying to put it. You know, is this within an order of magnitude of human experience? 
How much is a terawatt? Let me look it up. Google says, oh, no, that's energy. I want power. Power consumption. Energy per year. Eh, math. Is for losers. I don't even know what units these are in. What's going on here, Google? It used to be helpful. Okay, I found something on uh, Wikipedia. There is a lot of... I've, I think I went on the same search you did, where I found, like, spreadsheets of data, but, like, unlabeled numbers. Oh, how yeah. much energy did we use? Oh, about 400,000. 400,000 what? Yeah. 400,000 400,000 units! <laughs> it's a, it, I think it's 14,000 megatons of oil is the unit. I, I found a chart that says we use about four about four thousand terawatt hours per year. So yeah, a terawatt is within that's in the ballpark of but the kind of no, energy being used. No, it's not even close because it's a terawatt no. hours is it it's an energy unit. So if and then you have to divide that by the number of hours in the year to get the total power output. Well, there's got to be several of those. At least three. One for recording the diecast, one for editing the diecast, and one for making the video. All right. All right, I will leave it as an exercise rather than us Googling instead of doing the show. I'll leave it as an ex exercise for the listener. How much we do energy? How much energy we do? Anyway, in the game, it's like I've built 10 distinct shells around a blue giant star uh so it's it's a huge amount of energy in game it's enough that you don't have to wait very long to charge up your phone no all right so do you ever have to like power your guy in the game like aren't mm -hmm. you like a suit of armor yeah you're a robot well i assume you're a robot maybe there's someone trapped in there like powerless to prevent the consumption of the world and machines man uh, that outfit, <laughs> if that's a person in that suit, then it definitely needs to be hosed out <laughs> soon. But yeah, um, you do uh, power power production and, and management is like a, an ongoing theme throughout the game. You unlock higher and higher level things. At first, you're like burning sticks and twigs and leaves and things in your power generator or whatever. Um, and then you get like combustion generators and you can put sticks and twigs and stuff in those, but you can also put coal in them. So you put coal in there and then you can put oil in them and then you can refine the oil and, and then you can get nuclear power and then you can get fusion power and then you can get, uh, what's after that? Antimatter or something. Fission? Does it have fission? I, I actually think it doesn't have fission. It, it goes straight from like burning oil to like nuclear fusion fusion yeah fission's the big one they like skipped the the one we have and went right to the one we that has been it, it should promise you know what it should do they should put fusion power in a video game like uh sim city always has like your end game power plant is fusion yeah, yeah. the tokamak reactor i want one that's like okay You've begun building it, and it you know has that little pop up over the building. This will be done, and so this will be done in fifteen years. And then for the rest of the game, it will always say, "This will this building will be done in fifteen years." Uh huh. You just keep spending more and more money. It'd be a good dig. Good work if you can find it. The European Nuclear Fusion Alliance, or whatever it is. Those those cagey nuclear physicists swindling us all with their witchcraft. They know we're not going to check their numbers. <laughs> don't even understand. The problem is their numbers are all letters. I don't understand any of it. <laughs> <laughs> the are these even I letters? <laughs> the only number I understand it is the one with a dollar sign in front of it. <laughs> it's a really big number. And it keeps going up. And you try and ask them about why is this costing so much? And they just sort of phrase it in a way that if you don't, that implies that if you don't understand, you must be stupid. Oh boy. Still, just 15 more years. It's going to be great. Mm. So anyway, after you get to like nuclear fusion or whatever, then the next step after that is you can like harness the power of the star, then like convert into photons and then convert the photons into 
antiprotons and then like fuse those into a like antimatter fuel cell and like to give them credit they go up like several orders of magnitude every every step here so it's like it's a really big improvement um so i'm at that stage where i'm like pumping these things out and then uh but then it's like okay well i've, I've got so many of these like i don't ever have to worry about power again yeah what do you do with it all mine more materials to build more right to make four things yeah okay i see the, <laughs> i see with i see where this is going i've been on that treadmill before it's a tough yep, one to yep. get off well that's what i said i was like i've kind of reached that point where yeah these are some cool features it would have been nice like a hundred hours ago right let's say we do some mailbags yeah maybe we can reach the end of these Dear Diecast, in Seamus's Mass Effect retrospective, he mentions how the series always had a tension between its elements of Trekkie sci-fi and Lovecraftian horror, and would inevitably have to commit to one over the other. Spoiler, it never did. <laughs> it took the third way and decided to emulate Battlefield Earth. <laughs> Become a third game, unrelated to the previous two. So I was wondering if there are any other examples you might know of where there is any similar stark blend of genres, story types, or tension between big genre conventions in video games or other mediums. Kind regards, Andrew. One that I find uh, curious is Shaun of the Dead, which is kind of zombie survival and rom-com. It's yeah. Shaun... Sean gets back together with his girlfriend. Okay, that's a happy story that needs a happy ending. But the old zombie horror flicks are everybody dies. And so there was a certain degree of tension, and they solved that by um, making it a comedy. And that makes it all easier. <laughs> Still, though, I mean, that's comedy is also hard. Comedy is hard. There's another uh, mashup. They did um, action cop movie as a comedy with last action hero and i've always like been bothered by the particular weird like the the premise of last have you ever seen last action hero no i've never even heard of it classic 90s arnold schwarzenegger vehicle the idea is this kid is a huge fan of arnold schwarzenegger movies and this ongoing <laughs> wait, wait, wait. hang on hang on Hold, yeah. pump the brakes there it's a movie about a guy who's a fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger yes. movies. Yes, that's important. Yes, it does sound there's very kid, 90s. Th there's a kid really loves Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, and his favorite is the Jack Slater series, where Jack Slater's this, you know, you could kind of picture this. He's just like a quote-unquote police officer who fights quote-unquote bad guys. But because okay, hang on, it's a, hang on again. Is this a real series or is this no. a fictional series with real Arnold Schwarzenegger in it? Fictional series with real Arnold Schwarzenegger pretend making. So he made, yeah. So okay. this is a pretend I'm, movie I'm back inside track. of the real movie. Yeah. So Jack Slater, I mean, you know, Jack Slater doesn't seem to wear a police uniform or arrest people he just drives around getting in <laughs> car chases and shooting bad guys right <laughs> right sure it's like the james bond is a spy kind of thing exactly and he's got it you know and jack slater has a a chief that's always screaming at him and you've gone too far you're a loose cannon and i'm gonna take what you turn in your badge <laughs> like and you get the sense that this happens every movie so the kid's watching this movie and then due to magic wizardry the kid ends up in the movie he's propelled into the world of the movie with jack slater okay and this was the most so the kid is riding with jack slater and he knows all the tropes and he knows who the bad guy is because of like the his name <laughs> you know like he's obviously a bad guy did you see he had that fake eye <laughs> like right. the clothes red right like the kid is uh, hyper aware of all the genre tropes and keeps trying to explain them to jack but jack because he's you know is incapable of noticing He's an action schlock hero that cannot yeah. be genre savvy. Right, exactly. Otherwise, he would just be having this 
con continuous crisis of, my gosh, I'm in a car chase. Isn't that weird? <laughs> like, who does that? Like, a real car chase? Like, shouldn't I call for backup and they'll just, like, surround the city with police cars and chase them down with a helicopter? No, I better get in my old muscle car and roar across the city in this thing. <laughs> Good thing I filled up the gas before I started. So, there's a lot of funny moments in this movie as the kid tries to convince Jack Slater that they are in a movie. <laughs> to, to what end? And, and not only that, but you can tell that the series... Not only that, the writer did this brilliant job of not only creating this movie within a movie, but... Jack Slater, the movie series, is kind of old and it's out of ideas. Like you oh, get the man. You get the feeling that it's it's already past the point where they've ramped up, you know. He probably started fighting regular bad guys, but now, you know, every movie has to outdo the previous one. And this one's like number four. Oh man. And it's yeah. yeah. And it's just outrageous. And like in this one, his daughter, the bad guys come to menace his daughter and they take her in the other room and she's screaming and you hear her screaming in the other room and then it cuts in there to his daughter and the bad guys. And you see her like ah, ah, screaming, but she's actually kicking their ass and making screaming noises to cover it up. <laughs> and she's obviously, you know. A chip off the old block and she like you know a bunch of guys get her in her bedroom she just kicks their asses and not you know just pulverizes them with furniture <laughs> and it's a great it's a great scene it's hilarious and when she's done she's armed and she obviously knows how to use a firearm and she's ready to like kick the bad guys out of the house um but you could tell this is like this wasn't part of the series before like they're either introducing the daughter or she's been recast with an older actress and they've decided to add her to the action, you know, team. Add or another whatever. fighting character. Yeah, like another sidekick or something. Like just to keep things interesting. Sure. So that they like and you can feel that. I can just feel what the original movies were like. It is also brilliant. And then they muck it up in the middle of this Jack Slater movie. They're in a police station. All right. And then a cartoon cat comes in. And he's also a, a, a police officer like Jack Slater. And his name is Whiskers. And Jack Slater talks to Whiskers. And Whiskers is voiced very obviously by Danny DeVito. And it's funny because it's like none of the people in this movie seem to think it's weird that there's a cartoon cat. But right. that's not how cop movies work. They don't have cartoon right. characters in them. So yeah, yeah. This isn't Who Framed Roger Rabbit. In fact, nothing is Who right. Framed Roger Rabbit. Right. So it broke its own rules. The, the movie broke its own rules for like, what this movie within a movie is supposed to be mm, right but it's all it's always fascinated me it's it's not a great movie but it's a fascinating movie for like the things that the writer did that are incredibly hard and then the ways that they screwed it up huh i i spent entirely too long describing to you the last action hero for what a <laughs> mediocre movie it is but it's such a fascinating artifact of like 90s cinema mm. um do you have anything to add on genre mashups uh nothing nothing particularly insightful i mean it, it usually seems to happen with less skilled writers like when i'm reading fan fiction and stuff it, often you end up with like they're trying to use the original tone of the original work, but then they also are trying to do some other tone, and so they two get kind of mixed yeah. up, and neither one really works very well. Uh, anytime they have crossovers, anytime they've tried to do anything with 80s slasher movies, Freddy and Jason, anytime <laughs> you take those characters out of their original setting or premise, it immediately, everything dissolves. Like, you can't do horror... Like, 
horror is sort of unique in that, you know, you could make action and you could make action comedy and you could make, you know, a tragedy and you could make a tragic comedy. But I don't know. Can you mix horror with anything else and have it work? Like it just mm. stops being horror. Yeah, I have I have some thoughts on horror, but I, I feel like it's straying from the question at hand. Um, something that came to mind is that we've been talking about negative examples, but I think there's like some positive examples of like mixing really different genres. Like the Lego movie has all these different characters and each character kind of is existing within their own genre piece, right? Oh, They've each got yeah. their own kind of tone to their, like the world takes on the tone of each character. It's It's a fascinating study. That's a good one. I didn't think of that. Yeah. 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 Each little Lego world is its own genre and operates on its own rules. And you kind of have to like get with that rule set if you end up in that particular play set. <laughs> yeah. I think um, what the Dungeons and Dragons movie was trying to be like high adventure fantasy. But then I guess anytime they try to throw like teen romance into a movie on top of anything else it's just like no please yeah. please stop yeah you know they said oh wow twilight did really well so we should do that everywhere else and it's like yeah twilight did that but it was doing just that yeah it's weird that you want to mix it into other well you know what Twi no twilight was teen romance and zombie or er, not zombies vampires yeah, I mean, basically zombies. Um, I, I have a feeling that vampires would think of that as highly racist. Yep. Bite me. Wait, no, please don't. <laughs> um, so that's true. That That's one that didn't occur to me. Uh, you want to take this next email? All right. Dear Diecast, I've been playing a game called Escape Simulator. The game... The base game is a great virtual escape room simulator, and the amazing part comes from the Steam Workshop integration. There are tons of amazing user-created maps that are just as good and often better than the base game. And as a player, this is amazing. I get tons of content for low price point. But how do you think this will play out for the developer? When they release new content, will people buy it when it has to compete against free maps? Thanks, Rob Lundin. Thank you, Rob. That is an interesting question. I think AAA games don't really use... The workshop very much and indies that do use the workshop aren't you know they're usually making a game that they want to make very few indie developers sit down to make a franchise i have an idea for a never-ending mm -hmm. franchise of games i want to make forever you know <laughs> everybody's everybody like has this idea for a game they want to make and if opening that up to the workshop makes the game more valuable and it sells better that's a win for the developer. Um, so it's true that the the workshop might hurt possible future sales, but the few but the games where it would hurt the sales are probably games where they don't care about those future sales so much. Right. They're more worried and about if they do care the about the future sales. sales. They're not going to allow you to mod it because they're they're planning it. They got it on the roadmap. Right. And depending on how you set it up, I mean, you have to integrate the workshop yourself and you can just make it very easy to add, you know, some things and not others. Oh, great. You know what? Users can add new weapons and new skins and new characters and new voice files. But you know what? Making maps, that's that's what I want to do. I want to sell map packs. So I I won't give them the ability to add maps. I mean, another thing you could do is just put in the terms of service that you get to resell any maps that anybody makes. And then, you know, they can still get them for free. But if you want the convenience of having the handpicked developers, you know, like director's cut of the maps or whatever, then you just buy the expansion pack. Dear Diecast, previously on the podcast, Seamus has mentioned his wish that video game publishers would release their source code for commercial games once they were done selling. However, he also acknowledged that even if this were attainable, the results would be the release of an enormous code base that nobody can compile. What are your thoughts on archiving and preserving gaming? Uh, do you worry about the extent to which many games are tied to an arcane infrastructure of hardware and software that impede the likelihood that such games will still be playable in the distant future? Yours historically, Nick. 
Um, I have many thoughts on this. Do you have any thoughts? Because I'm, I'm about to go off. Um, okay. Do you have any thoughts on this? Let's see if I can steal your thunder. Uh, I think that the best games that uh, people actually enjoy playing will be recreated as mini games in future games. There's a lot of truth to that. And just, yeah, like how many times, it, yeah. World of Other Warcraft in have, point, right? Like, yeah. it's got Pokemon in it now. It's got, you know, Pong. It's got all that stuff. I think there was a version of Doom that let you play Doom inside of Doom. Or maybe that was Wolf. That was Wolfenstein. <laughs> Still, though. Um, well, I think, broadly speaking, the most... Po we don't have to worry about the most popular games. The, you know, even if they're a pain in the ass to compile, which some of them would be, but the community would figure it out. Uh... Third-party libraries would definitely be a problem. But, you know, people have done some amazing stuff with code bases over the years. Like, modded the hell out of a lot of 90s shooters that had their source released. We don't know what would happen to a modern code base, because nobody releases modern code anymore. Well, that I mean, or it's already on a platform that has a fairly open source system. Uh, are you thinking of Minecraft? Well, Minecraft and, like, anything written in... Um... What in Unity, you can decompile C Sharp pretty easily. Um, the other thing is, I have a nephew who is really into preservation. He takes it really seriously. His name's Cam. Uh, um, he is a really cool kid. He's he's in his early twenties, I think. And you think, oh yeah, he's probably you know all about preserving the stuff he played as a kid, you know, N sixty four games and that. But no, actually, when he was a kid, that would be like. PlayStation 2 games. Jeez. <laughs> Ugh. Time is weird. Anyway, but no, he is... He collects and restores as much as possible uh, old video game cabinets. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, he takes the conservation... RSP. He's not just doing it because uh, old games are cool. He's really serious about conservation. Like... He has a special hatred for when he sees somebody that, like, bought an old Pac-Man machine and installed one of the multi-mod chips so that you could use the Pac-Man to play either Space Invaders or Asteroids or Kicks or Breakout or Pac-Man or Ms. Pac-Man or Japanese Pac-Man or Pac-Man Jr. or Super Pac-Man. And, <laughs> you know, one of these just, Horrible, and they, you know, paint over the original artwork and, you know, on the sides to redecorate the case, or they cut up the case to do things with it, and he's very serious about, you know, restoring the machine as much as possible to how it looked and sounded in its, in its natural time period, which there's, that's important. Somebody needs to be doing that, and I'm, mm. so I'm really grateful for guys like Cam that put in the time and learn about, you know, these old machines, the, a lot of this knowledge is folk knowledge at this point. It is not well documented. Right. And, you know, without these hobbyists, without these hobbyists out there working on it, these machines would be dying and just our past would be vanishing. So, you know, he, he buys, you know, a couple broken machines, put them together and makes a good one. I don't know if he he doesn't make a living at it, and he doesn't have a great job. He does. It's not like he's got some, you know, programming job that gives him tons of disposable income that he can, you know, pour into this. Like somebody restoring old cars. He, he like a lot of millennials. He's you know still on the bottom rung of the old, the old job ladder. Yeah. But this is what he puts his money into. It, conservation I, I i often wish there was some way to get him in a position where he could use his skills um in a professional capacity because he's he's good and he's really conscientious about the old machines he's um, got to start a video game museum or something there are a couple out there none of them in pittsburgh though mm -hmm. which is where cam lives aren't they starting some sort of giant like video game thing in pittsburgh like a was it like a like a stadium like an e-gaming stadium i have not heard of this but i don't pay attention to things that happen uh outside <laughs> um so yeah th there is no good there's no like one 
magic bullet solution, but given the number of of publishers that lose their code, we were just having a thread on my on my website today, talking about how much code Sony has no not Sony Square Enix, like Square Enix just regularly would lose the code. Here mm. you made this pro, you put years of work into making this product, and then like where's the code? Did anybody have it? It was probably died on some hard drive somewhere. You know, the only copy was on these old beige box computers sitting in a corner. And then one day somebody was like, why do we still have these old computers here? And just threw them out. And there went your source Ugh. code. Wow. Yeah. Or the drive failed or something. Right. And it's like, you should have, uh, I mean, given the expense of creating a video game, there's just it's insane to not have off-site backups i i have off-site backups of my drive it's only a few terabytes and it's like a few bucks a month like <laughs> it's nothing mm -hmm. it's it's less yeah. than you spend on coffee at a company every month and i have complete off-site back so you know a few terabytes for a few bucks a month is enough for me to back up huge libraries of video files Backing up your source is easy. If nothing else, you could zip the thing and Gmail it to yourself once a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's probably some internal concern about security, right? I mean, like, if, if you're really serious you about, like, no one can get access to my source code, because otherwise they'll, like, rip off our game and, like, <laughs> right. Tencent will make a copy of it or something. So the one way to make sure that doesn't happen is to delete it. <laughs> I know. I, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but, you know, there can be some hesitancy to, like, yeah. you know, yeah. let go of that stuff. Especially, Squeenix is a, a Japanese company, isn't it? Yes. And they are much more... Oh, they are so careful. They take it so seriously. And, uh, you know, given the choice between two fates, either your code base will be released to the wild and everybody will get it, or it will be vanished from the world forever. Um, I consider the second one much worse. Yeah, as do I, but I, I realize there are people who feel the opposite way, so I don't know. That makes sense. That those people are aliens. I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. But it's like, you know, it's like an artist who's who's like, I can't let anyone see this. They might find out that I'm a hack, right? I have to burn it. <laughs> okay, I can, I can, I can identify with that. Um, yeah, but... Just even if you release the code, you never, it can't actually hurt you financially, I don't think. Uh, aside from the risk of if you have ongoing multiplayer, if people can make their own clients, that does make cheating so much easier. But if you're just talking, if we're just talking single player games, giving away the source should not hurt you because, of course, the artwork is still copyrighted. Somebody still needs to buy the game before the source is mm. useful to them. Right. Yeah, depending on how, how tight the borders are between your assets and your game engine. Yeah. Well, I I get the feeling that probably in another generation, we're going to have a lot of regret. Just like people have regret now, like, wait, what? The first episodes of Doctor Who don't exist? But it's such an important show. Who taped over them? Who taped right. over them with Benny Hill? What? How did that happen? <laughs> what? What terrible, terrible thing happened to mankind that they al they allowed that to happen? And yeah. it'll seem insane and reckless and irresponsible to the future. And then they'll start taking preservation seriously. And we'll probably miss a lot. The, like the first generation of movies are all gone. Like the mm -hmm. first batch of movies just no longer people made a movie and it stopped existing at some point and that's going to happen with a lot of early games eventually like today movies do not vanish Nobody sometimes you kind of wish they it. would yeah right but everybody's gotten very good at preservation because they've learned the hard way that it sucks to they've all had that one thing hey we used to have that and it didn't pan out and we didn't release it but boy it would be great to have it now oh we didn't keep it. Why didn't yeah. we keep it? It would have been so cheap. So, I don't know. 
Uh, the question here, where do you think most of this responsibility would sit? I think the responsibility comes in steps. And the first step has to be with the people who made these games. They have to give the world some ability to preserve the games. Either do it yourself or allow the crowds to do it. But if they don't do that, then there's nothing we can do to preserve these games. Or very little. Yeah, I mean, hackers can always get in and, like, reverse engineer stuff. It's never as good, but it's it's possible. Right. And that works for big popular stuff. But, like, a lot of the stuff on the margins is just going to vanish. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if it becomes important later. Well, and that's the trick, right? You you can't keep you can't keep everything. I mean, you you have to at some point you have to let it go, right? Something has to go. I don't know. Hard drive space is pretty cheap, and source code is pretty small. It's true. Dear Diecast, in an earlier podcast, Seamus mentioned that he felt like Avengers Endgame was an appropriate jumping off point for the MCU. However, since then, I have heard him mention snippets about recent MCU television shows, WandaVision, etc. Does that mean that? You have fallen off the wagon and are back on the bandwagon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what do you think of the new Spider-Man movies? Spider sensing your reply, Nick. Thank you, Nick. So I like them. Uh, Spider-Man's still my favorite superhero, but I haven't even watched the newest one because I'm not going to the theater. I'm just waiting for stuff to show up on. Like I, I don't want to go to the theater anymore. Watching at home is just a better experience. And so if they're going to keep putting movies out at home. Or so I can watch them at home, then that's what I'll keep doing. Uh, okay, a quick rundown of the TV shows. I thought Wonder Vision was brilliant. I thought Loki was a half-hour idea stretched into six hours of TV. It's very boring. Ugh. Captain America and the Winter Soldier offended me because Captain America defended terrorists because he liked something about their goals or they had lofty goals so it's okay that they're terrorists it just i puke on it i puke on captain america and the winter soldier i vomit on the whole thing um the hawkeye series doesn't work hawkeye in the movies went through a very dark time and murdered tons of dudes dozens and dozens of people now they were all bad guys they were all you know career criminals but he went in and stabbed them with the sword okay he was the punisher mm. it was that's very dark and that is deeply immoral <laughs> even if some of the even if some of them had it coming you just you you don't go and murder people like that um and then they gave him his own series where suddenly it slams back into cartoon mode and it's all fantasy violence and people like doing improbably cartoonish things and nobody's in real danger and it's all kind of silly. But it's dealing with the fallout like, oh, because you murdered all these bad guys, now you've got more bad guys after you. But these bad guys <laughs> employ tactics that do not fit with the earlier material. Like at one point, spoiler, Hawkeye gets captured. And they're in some sort of, like, where even are they? Like, a bad guy lair. Like, these guys have a lair and not, like, just, you know. That's an a very building somewhere or something. Right. It's a lair and it has, like, um, there's coin-operated rides where you, like, it's like a little horse, like a big plastic sure. go around style horse. And you put a quarter in and you put the kid on and the kid, it rocks back and forth. They tie Hawkeye to one of those, and he's up on this horse, and it's not, I mean, I guess they're interrogating him, and this is their quote-unquote torture, but for a guy that murdered a bunch of them, this is very tame. <laughs> <laughs> and we're supposed to, uh, once again, sympathize with the villain here, and I don't know. I couldn't take it seriously, and it was just tonal whiplash. Did not work for yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it's the it genre off. tensions thing again, right? Like, yeah. you can do either one of those things, but, like, not in the same show. Right. You can't You can't ever have a story where the Punisher gets up to wacky hijinks and, like, with, 
with bad guys and and trades like groaner puns with them you know with a cartoon like, cat right <laughs> like the, it just it doesn't work so so far the netflix show or the the tv shows have a terrible track record WandaVision was the only one I liked, and I keep coming back to them, and I keep being disgusted and disappointed. Um, this question was about Spider-Man anyway. I like the Spider-Man movies, but I have not seen the new one. And I won't for a couple more months, I think. I don't think it comes to streaming mm -hmm. until, like, spring, maybe. So that's what I think of the Spider-Man movies. All right. Hey, Diecasters, in case you hadn't noticed, the Anacruzis dropped recently in early access. Uh, it's left for dead, but 70s sci-fi. My first session left me sweating. A few random players and I barely, and I mean barely, managed to beat the first episode. Almost, but not quite wiping at the finale. It left me so exhausted that I had to take a break after the one and quarter hour it took to finish. Uh, later, I stumbled on this article by Chet Falizek. Looks like that intensity is by design. Oh boy, does it seem to hit the mark. And then there's a follow-up to this question. Like, that asks about it, but then they sent another email. And this one gets to the heart of it. I noticed that the Anna Cruz is, is pretty much dead in the water, despite it being really good. Marketing has been next to non-existent. With the success of Deep Rock Galactic, another four-player co-op horde shooter, one would assume that there'd be a market for games like the Anacruzis. Any idea how and why it is invisible to the gaming community? Kind regards, Norbert Lickle. Okay, that was long, but it was important. So here's the thing. Have you heard about Back for Blood, Paul? Yeah, we talked about it on the show a couple times, I think. I saw, and I noticed Back for Blood also kind of disappeared from the conversation rapidly and i thought that was very curious until i saw a youtube video that said how valve carried left for dead or something about how proving that valve was the magic behind Le the original left for dead hmm. and he did a side-by-side -side comparison of back for blood and left for dead and it was drastic um I never really appreciated the work that went into Left 4 Dead. I mean, I knew it was a great game, and I knew I loved it, but I never really thought about, like, because I didn't compare it to other shooters for whatever reason. It was like its own thing. Mm -hmm. But now we have another game trying to do the same thing, and comparing them side by side is drastic. Okay, so this video talks about what they did making Left 4 Dead. They hired a stuntman and a mo used a motion capture studio to capture 200 different death animations. What? 200? There are, and it shows some of them, and I'm like, yeah, I have seen that, and I have noticed that. Like, you shoot a zombie in Left 4 Dead, and you shoot him in the arm, and it's... And it noticeably it doesn't just fall down you know like so many modern games it doesn't just ragdoll it that part of its body jerks away and it spins but wait it's a zombie blowing its arm off doesn't kill it so you blow its arm off and it knocks it back spins it around it recovers its footing and starts coming at you again after being spun around or you shoot one of them and it sort of like collapses gradually and slams face first into the wall and slides down the wall. And there are just countless possible combinations of where they get shot and what they run into and how they die and where the impact is on their body to produce this incredible variety of animations. Hmm. And they're not like generated on the fly. They're they're actually mocapped and like blended together to suit the environment. They are. It's both. It's like a bit of it, it is mocapped. It's these two hundred different mocapped animations, but then also blended with you know in some sort of environmental thing you know that lets them. I don't know. Maybe it helps them down to the ground after a certain point, and then 
this video cuts over to Back for Blood, and it just looks like a no normal shooter. You shoot one of them, and they just sort of fall over, and it doesn't really have a lot to do with where you shot them. And you don't, their body doesn't reflect all this force going into it. You don't see their body like flail back and they struggle to keep their balance under all this force. They either die and just collapse like a rag doll, or they keep coming and they don't seem to notice the hit. You don't have these partial hits that make them stagger and then they recover their footing and keep coming at you. Mm -hmm. And that's just one little detail. And there are just hundreds of little details like this. How the sound is mixed. How the weapons sound. How the weapons behave. How ammo is handled. How lighting is done. How you're guided through the environments. How the, and there's all these things that are very obviously the product of Valve software and their ongoing process of testing and testing and testing on real players and then adjusting the design. Right, right. Well, they did like automated eye tracking for their game testers, right? I'd heard that too. I don't remember where. Yeah. Well, it and there's a million other things like in Left 4 Dead, all so much stuff is breakable. You go into a room and you just shotgun the furniture and it flies apart, stuffing flies out of the couch, the TV shatters. Um Debris will fly all over the room according to physics. You blow the legs off a table and it'll fall over, right? And then you mm -hmm. shoot stuff in Back for Blood and it's all static geometry with baked lighting, so none of it can move. Oh, man. And so, like, this is stuff that I probably wouldn't notice if I just jumped into the game. I'll bet it's... A, this is... The, uh, I realize I've... I've taking you on a long journey here but the point i'm making is this is stuff that you don't immediately go like wow did you see that ta paul did you see that table leg shatter did you see how the table fell over and the printer fell on the floor that was an amazing moment in gaming <laughs> it's like <laughs> right no it just right. happens it just happens and it's part of just the but then you get into back for blood and that doesn't happen and you it bugs you and you don't know why. Right. And it feels like you're playing Fortnite or something. And it's like, I could right. just play, be playing Fortnite instead of this. Um, so, and then after Back for Blood was out for a few weeks, somebody pointed out that the number of concurrent Left for Dead players was greater than the number of Back for Blood players. Oh, no. So my answer to this question about the Anna Cruzes is, I think it's the same thing. I think horde shooters are less about the shooting and more about the horde. Um, there are a lot of fine details that went into that original game that take a lot of budget to replicate. And these, you look at it and you think, I've got ragdoll physics. I can just, you know, copy paste a thousand models and we can shoot them all. And you're overlooking the work that went into making the lighting and everything feel just right and a level that sort of pulls you through its design and make its intentions clear and has lots of interactive elements and where players feel like they're involved in the process and you know nobody's just standing around with like oh, there's nothing for me to do um or i don't i'm not sure what the game expects me to be doing right now you know all of those things are very hard to get right, and we take them for granted until they're gone. And that's what I think happened to both of these horde shooters recently. I think both projects massively underestimated what it would take to copy Left 4 Dead. And part of the question, too, was about the automatic difficulty scaling. And I, I did read the article um, by Chet Falizek, and it, it is really cool how they tried to get the game to adjust the difficulty so that you were playing at the edge of your skill level. But the whole time I was reading the article, I was just thinking that that whole system seems like it's very gameable. Like if you were, if you were playing the game naively and just trying to yeah. do your best, then it would work great. But as soon as you're aware that the game is trying to put you to the edge of your skill level, you can just hold back and pretend that you're bad at the game and <laughs> And then the game will be like, okay, you know, hold your hand. And then it's like, oh, now it's easy. And it's, it's like, it's, it's metagaming, right? Like, 
So I don't know. I don't. I don't know how how much impact that would have on the experience, but it doesn't there seem was, like it would be positive. Uh, awesome games done quick was last week, and I just watched a speed run. I forget which game it was, but it was a game that does this. It judges how you're doing and uses that to determine the difficulty, and it looks at how accurate your shooting is and how much damage you've taken. And so a speed running strategy is to run around missing on purpose and injuring yourself. <laughs> so that it doesn't spawn enemies and then you like run through the thing and win. Right. The game thinks you're terrible. And so it like, let's just, yeah, it's a gameable. It, it sounds good, but I mean, that's basically what uh, Control did. If you remember that game about you know, mm, where he mm -hmm. plays the spook police. And that one ramps up the difficulty until it successfully kills you and then backs off, which that's the worst. That's <laughs> the, it's bad enough to go up to the threshold so that I have to work really hard, but it's even worse to like, okay, I'm just going to kill you. Oh, that was too much. All right, I'll back off. It's like, it's like uh, somebody's trying to train you to lift weights, so they keep giving you heavier and heavier weights until you fall over and injure yourself. And they're like, okay, we'll, we'll go one down from that. Looks like we found your limit, champ. <laughs> right? As soon as you get that cast off, we're going to have one less than that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't like that either. But I think even if that worked, I'll bet you neither game uh, has the appeal of the original. They are not going to have that depth of variety and interactivity that we all sort of took for granted back in 2009. Mm, right. Well, because part of it is it's, it's a game that makes you feel like you're in a zombie movie. And zombie movies don't yep. have like static pre-lit geometry. It's just... It doesn't fit with the genre. Right. And a world of chaos sort of needs to be, especially a game designed to be replayed, you really want the the environments to be dynamic. There's a, a gas station you can blow up and left for dead. Totally pointless. It adds nothing to the gameplay. Like, you don't get near <laughs> the gas station, but players run by and shotgun the gas pumps and expect it to blow up because, I mean, a zombie movie. Of course the of course the pumps would explode in so much that they blow the roof off the place. That makes perfect sense. No further questions. <laughs> Lightly peppered with birdshot. Right. That's what people expect. So and then, you know, you cut to let to back for blood and it has gas pumps. And you can shoot them and throw explosives at them and jump up and down on them and they're they're just furniture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and part of that many... too is about yeah. respecting the language of gaming, right? Like you put red barrels in your game, they better blow up with fireball. Oh, right. Yeah. If you don't, if you got to have barrels in your game and they're not going to blow up, do not make them brightly colored. They should be just, they should look empty and just be rust colored or whatever. Right. If you, if you make them green, then we're going to assume it's filled with uh, acid or poison. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Make them beige and have like crackers stenciled on the outside or something. <laughs> Actually, even it, you have it say crackers on the side and have it explode anyway. <laughs> there you go. Oh, health up! Boom! I got him with the saltines. I am sad to hear that the Anna Cruzes also did poorly. But after seeing, the, I will link this video in the show notes. It's a great video. I suggest people watch it. Okay. I think we're going to call it there, Paul. It's been quite a show. What a roller coaster. Thanks so much to everyone who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. I hope until next week. Please come back, Seamus.